Welcome everyone online and in person to this conversation with Michael Gillespie and Hugh Ryan. My name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, which is where you now find yourself. And I'm assisted by uh, Ryan Warden, our volunteer. Uh, the Bureau, as many of you know, is a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And this is the service that we provide, is holding this space for queer books and queer culture. So we're an all volunteer organization. We do have a suggested donation of 10 bucks, but give whatever you can, if you can. And if money is tight and you wanna buy a book, you should hold on to your money and buy a book. Mm -hmm. uh, sir. And there's change in there if you need. Um, what else do I need to say? If you're not on our email list yet, uh, you can sign up for that at the back of the room and you'll get an email every other Monday about our many upcoming events. Now that we're in September, the events are back in full swing. Uh, so we have a lot lined up for this month and beyond. Uh, so we hope you'll be joining us. And that's it for me. I'm gonna turn it over to our two guests for tonight and we're gonna jump right in. So please give them a warm welcome. Thank you everybody for coming tonight and thank you for hosting us. Uh, this is one of those rare and wonderful moments where my professional life and my personal life have collided beautifully. I've known Michael for a long time, but the book, Berlin Garden of Erotic Delights, I had never heard of, which seemed shocking to me once Michael told me about it and I read the book. It was like, oh, this so neatly aligns with the exact same things I was researching with when Brooklyn was queer. I mean, uh, ocean apart. But aside from that, it was basically on the same level. Uh, and I just had never heard about the books, did not know it existed, and was captivated by the stories, and more than just by the stories, by the world that it opened me up into uh, and gave us a little taste of. So, Michael, I'm so delighted that you translated this book and that you made it available for all of us, and that we have a space like the Bureau to have this conversation in, uh, especially given I don't know if you all have heard last few years, kind of been a little weird pandemic, <laughs> so maybe you know. Anyway, it's a delight to be in this room together talking about queer history and queer books with so many wonderful faces. Uh, so thank you all for coming tonight. We're gonna jump right in, okay. that's good with you. So tell us, what is the Berlin Garden of Erotic Delights and how, who wrote it? When was it written? So you mentioned that when I first uh, mentioned the uh, book to you, author you hadn't heard of them. Trust me, no one had ever heard of this person, and partly because of, uh, due to the fact that uh, the uh, book was censored when it first came out and, uh, and, became, and became forgotten. It was written by uh, someone named Granan, G-R-A-N-A-N, -A -A -N. years of 1885 to 1939. Uh, that's his pen name. Uh, we went with his pen name for the uh, for the translation, which is also what he used for his uh, original book. I have a copy of a reprint of the 1993 uh, edition of the, of the, uh, of the book. Um, and uh, he was a uh, writer, uh, artist, uh, art historian, critic, theater director, most crucially a theater director. And as we'll see, uh, his background in the theater manifests itself in various ways in the, in the stories that he writes. Um, the, co the collection that he wrote, he, he, he published um, uh, two short story collections in his lifetime, this one that we're uh, discussing, and one which explored the theme of heterosexual love, uh, the lover's fairy, lover's fairy tales, or something like that. And the, this collection, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a collection of five short stories, each of which centers on a specific erotic encounter between men. And one of the things this allows him to do is to show uh, and explore a variety of characters, a variety of types uh, of characters. Um, and from Berlin club goers to a foreign businessman to a burglar. And uh, I will say the burglar story is my personal favorite story. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so surprising. Uh, like the actual like arc of the story, I, I just, uh, 
I did not expect them to have that kind of interest. And it's interesting <laughs> also, because Freddie in that story is on, on one hand, it's a piece of type, it's some sort of a, a problem in the state, uh, but who also uh, is in control ultimately. In that sense, he's not performing the type. But uh, so that's, that's uh, it's an interesting, I, I, I myself have changed from time to time, which is my favorite story. I have claimed there's several of them, <laughs> and, but I like that one as well. Um, but there are, there are four interesting things I think about the collection I want to point out. One is that he assumes a queer audience, which is, which is uh, noteworthy, I think, and unusual for the, for the period. And, uh, and as I began to say, the the variety of characters, which allows him to explore a variety of types, which is something which was uh, which was also the subject of much research that was going on at the time of gender identity and so on. And he so he he, he sort of uh, mines that for his work. And then in each of the each of the encounters allows the characters to achieve some kind of greater self understanding. He's very explicit about this. Uh, and he avoids sort of the, the more usual tragic mode. There are a lot of references to Thomas Mann in here, and not, and, and not just Death in Venice, but others as well. And uh, uh, it presents uh, a very different uh, uh, view toward this. Um, and, uh, and the fourth thing I wanted to say about it is uh, that all of this is told in a style that is humorous and ironic, frank and sympathetic uh, toward, toward these characters. Uh, the humor runs, uh, runs uh, obviously throughout, throughout the entire collection. Um, in terms of these types, by the way, uh, also a book that I would mention uh, that's important for that is uh, one by uh, Robert Nietzsche titled Gay Berlin, Birthplace of a Modern Identity. And I noticed that the bookstore has that uh, on its shelf. Some critical detail about this, uh, about, about what we've done at the time in terms of gender identity. Um, but a central fact about the collection as well is that it was censored. In 1920, he published it in 1920, and, 19, and it was, uh, it was uh, uh, censored by regional courts in Berlin and Leipzig. Um, it, 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 was, it was to have been made unusable language of the paragraph of the law that was relevant to this. Now, um, uh, many people have asked me, well, how could that be? You know, uh, this is Weimar Republic, uh, a period of great innovation and uh, freedom and so on. And uh, we ultimately, in 1919, in fact, uh, censorship was banned in the Constitution. And yet, one year later, 1920, uh, in the case of Renan's book, it gets, it's banned despite this momentary change uh, in the law. Unfortunately, since then, this has become easier to understand for us. We now know how fundamental principles seemingly embedded in a, in a nation's Constitution can uh, the next day disappear. So um, that 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 question, fortunately, is much more understandable now. I think. Thanks, I think we all know that after the 1920s in Germany, only wonderful things happened. And this is not an indicator of anything possible <laughs> in the future, right? No, nothing to worry. Double. So so, book is. 102 years old, censored in its own time period, in German, largely forgotten by an author who only published one book of LGBTQ stories. How did you come across it and, and what made you decide to translate it? Well, it was um, serendipity, really. In the introduction, I offer uh, two different versions of how I discovered the book. In uh, one, I was in a uh, Schroeder's Museum museum in Berlin when I first came across it. I, I think I, I, I'm referring to a period when I was thinking about you know, 
how I came across this book. That was nearly 30 years ago. So this is why I was, this is why I was foggy in my memory. Um, and then the other, uh, my husband Marvin is, uh, here, has a very distinct memory of our being in a bookstore, a different light. It's a different okay. light. It's on Hud, down on Hudson, uh, Marvin here. And I was meaning, uh, I found this book, it was sort of an oddity. Uh, it didn't fit into any particular category in the bookstore, just something that they, that they had available. Who knows how it got there? Uh, and uh, I actually like Marvin's version better. I mean, <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't insist upon it if his memory of it wasn't so, um, wasn't so clear. So that was the 1993 this one, reprint that, uh, of the original uh, that I found. And one of the, the, one of the things that um, struck me the most is that it offered a uh, positive portrayal of same-sex desire uh, at a uh, moment when um, it's easy for us to forget how, how dark that particular moment was in early to mid-90s in particular. Uh, and uh, there was a hunger, I think, for more positive images uh, to be made available. And so I, um, uh, that motivated me. And I, I started simply by translating it for myself. Uh, I didn't have any plan uh, beyond that. And um, over the years, I, did not, I didn't work continuously from 1993 to four or whatever I started until now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but I, uh, I, every so often I would pick it up again. Um, and uh, I would, it allowed me also to try out different approaches, which can be dangerous because they can, those different approaches can lurk around and, uh, and find their way back into falling back into text. But, um, uh, and then, uh, the, so I did end up over the years sending it to a variety of publishers. Uh, the, the consistent response was that it's not commercially viable uh, until I uh, ended up at Warfield Press, uh, where they understood immediately the significance of the work and were enthusiastic about uh, that. So that's, that's a story of him, of my father, my father. That's fantastic. And I think it is so indicative of what you're just saying. The di distance between 1992 and now is right. huge. I mean, I think we all know the difference between now and, and 1922 is huge. Right. But in terms of not just about what is available, but what published, I mean, just looking over here is a number of like LGBTQ history books of different kinds. I mean, obviously we're in a specific venue right now, <laughs> but I do think that there is more willingness to publish, more excitement. I mean, hunger for these books, mm -hmm. uh, more places like this that will sell them. So mm -hmm. it's great to have this uh, in among them. And I want to talk more about the, the translation, how you went about doing it in a moment. But while you were doing this, over these, these many years where you've been kind of contending with the text, what did you learn about Gren Grenand? Am I saying that right? Yeah, none. Who, who was he? And what happened with him after publishing this book? What, what happened to the censorship case? Uh, well, it's uh... The censorship it was censored, so I guess that it's you know, that story through through all the years. I mean, it, it, it was published in 1920; it was immediately banned. Uh, there wasn't a, a reprint until 1993, and then this English translation in 2022. So, for most of it, it's had a rough life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, it's um, and but you ask about Renan himself, uh, and it's like. Very little is known about him. Um, it was to show how little known he was, there was no Wikipedia entry. <laughs> um, there was a slight one in the German Wikipedia, but there was nothing at all in, um, in English. That's changed, by the way. There's a, a Wikipedia administrator, a contributor, who uh, has uh, put together a very fine entry, actually, um, that went on. So, uh, insofar as part of the purpose of this project is to get him better known, that's a good step. Um, 
but he's, uh, you know, we, we know where he was born in a city in central Germany, which is about two hours outside of uh, Berlin, that he went to a Prussian Academy school. That's the one that um, is referred to in one of the stories, uh, the cadets. Uh, there's a lot of autobiographical sprinkling of things throughout the collection, including most prominently in the final story. Um, he was, uh, his, 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 uh, he started uh, in law and ended up studying art history. And uh, his most significant work seems to have been when he, after his, completed his art history degree and moved to Berlin, uh, where he was a uh, director at the German theater and worked under uh, Max Reinhardt, who is probably uh, the most uh, prominent director of German language drama in the 20th century. Uh, and he went from there to Munich, where he was also worked in the theater. The next year was when he published his two collections of stories. Um, we know that uh, later he converted to Catholicism and uh, married a woman. And in uh, April 10, 1939, there was a commemorative exhibition that was uh, put on in uh, Rio de Janeiro to him. And it was interesting, one of the most interesting facts about that commemoration is that neither of the short story collections is mentioned. <laughs> Which I can't explain. It's, uh, it's sort of like it's something that raises more more questions than it, than it answers. But but if if you look at it through the lens of this sort of the invisibility of this book, it ends in what should be you know a comprehensive view of what he's done. Is that they're missing. They both are missing. Uh, so uh, and that's that's uh, that's about that's what we know about the book. Have you read the other book? No. <laughs> I'm curious how it uh, matches yeah, up. Yeah. Um, I can start that. <laughs> it's good to have a new project. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned, though, that he studs the stories with autobiographical details, yeah. uh, little moments of his life. And also, the, one of the great things about the book or that really drew you to it is how assertive the characters are about their queer identities, mm -hmm. how, how much it is about queer life. As someone who I know a little bit about Brooklyn in the 1920s, but I don't know a ton about Berlin other than sort of the big picture Weimar Republic cabaret. How true to life did you do you know are these stories? Is, is he talking about sort of real places, real situations in which he has created a fiction, or are we dealing with some amount of projections of life as he hoped it would be in the city? Is it? all over the place. I know if you talk to current fiction authors, they hate when you ask, how much of this is real? But <laughs> when we're going historical, I think it becomes important because this could be an absolute complete picture. This could be his mm -hmm. real friends that their names changed, or this could be a total fabulation. And I'm, I'm just curious, what's your sense? Well, you know, I think it's the former. Uh, you mentioned also other treatments of the period, and you know, say Christopher Fisher was saying, and suggesting that, that and uh, also uh, some adaptations of his, of his book, Goodbye to Berlin, and so on, which, uh, which offer an outside perspective of, of, the, uh, of the period, quite different from what we have here, which is uh, an insider view, an insider perspective. On the thing. And I think so. Uh, you, you can imagine that he's known people like these characters that he's, uh, that he's writing about. And, um, I, and I think that more than anything is, is, is the value of the work, that you get something about that period that you don't get anywhere else. Um, the, uh, I can, the, the club scenes, especially in Nemesis, I don't know anything else like it. Nothing, nothing else to play. Uh, so this, this, this takes its audience, which if at best uh, knows this period on a kind of superficial external level, it takes them right into the, what was going on. And, um, and the range of character, the, the, from representing the, the military, the working class, 
the money that we need for that election. Uh, there are all ways in which he, uh, you know, uh, so he writes about what he knows. Um, and um, the, the other thing that's interesting uh, about that, which is also true of, of all the stories, is, the, the, is that the character's erotic desires are simply taken for granted. And the question that in every single story, that's, that's the case. Uh, in that respect, also, I draw attention to the prologue uh, of the book, which the more I read it, even after this having been printed, I realized uh, how important it was to the book as a whole. You have, uh, yeah, at the very beginning, it's this prologue, which he calls the little garden, which uh, seems to me almost a kind of definition of fear. <laughs> this little garden is no artfully constructed, well-maintained, stylized park. It has crooked, convoluted, and uncontrolled paths. Flowers and the dazzling colors of a farmer's garden are with riotously fragrant aromas. It has thorns and plenty of weeds. <laughs> but over it all, the great hot sun shines, the melancholy moon passes by, and the innocent stars twinkle. This garden is a slice of life. So, so he, there, I think you also see him really speaking to his audience and wanting to get uh, around the censors. You asked you know, earlier also about you know, what did I come to learn about Renan. I think that he really wanted these collections, this one in particular, to, to have an audience, to be published in the end, to have an audience. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I say that only from having spent this much time with him But I, and I think that that was a source of disappointment to him. so far as, and I say that we don't really know that much about him to come to conclusions like that, but that's a different story. Yeah. I like the point you make about the difference between the insider's view from the outsider's view. As a, a pathetic American, I speak only one language. Uh, and so while I love reading all of these tourist accounts of going to other places and queer life there, you feel like they're always, the gay tourist always thinks there are no rules, everything is fabulous, you can do what you want. Uh, and you wonder, how realistic is that compared to the experiences of someone who lived there at the time, mm -hmm. knew the ins and outs, knew what the rules really were. Uh, so it's, it's great to hear that this sort of, not exactly corroborates Isherwood, but that they're writing of a generally similar sort of time in life, because I spent so much of my life picturing myself in that time, it would suck to learn the all things. <laughs> <laughs> I want to turn away for a moment from Grenon and his book to your book. I, as I said, speak only one language, cannot even imagine the work of a translator. I can barely think in English, let alone <laughs> in two languages. How did you do it? Both translating the book and, and keeping its, its queer spirit or making the queer spirit legible mm -hmm. to today, you know, just in terms of the words that you chose and, and, and just in general, but also how did you do it and keep his particular voice? I think there are probably more similarities between the uh, periods, actually. Uh, and I think what's most noteworthy are some of the similarities uh, uh, between the two. And uh, so I think that makes it somewhat uh, easier to, to translate. But um, what, what is difficult here, I think, is the, the peculiar style of, of Grenon. You mentioned you know, his, his work in the theater and how, and what we didn't talk about yet, is how that manifests itself in his uh, style of his work. He, he, each of the stories begins giving a kind of like stage directions. Uh, you have all these asides that occur uh, with the uh, authorial asides. And, Sort of, sort of dives into the conversation, and uh, in in um, in the in the, uh, in the in Nemesis, for example, at one point, um, 
Well, actually, you know, this is from your baby story. And Ruben is telling his story. And the author says at some point, at one point, now the story begins to become a bit sentimental. Georgie winks his eyes. So it's, but these are all, what's, what's, I don't know if this is a difficulty particularly, but it, what's, it's important that all these, uh, all these moments be honored. This is something we talk about a lot in the course of translation. So uh, the, uh, the, the other thing that's, that was important to preserve throughout this, we mentioned his wit and, and humor. Uh, not, not, not a uh, prominent teacher of German literature. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 yet a prominent, and, and yet this is suffused with the, uh, the author's uh, wit. And that has to be made some of it is subtle, some of it is quite, uh, is not so subtle. Uh, there's, uh, beyond any of that, there's also sort of a, a general concern, I think, in translation with sound. So, and I think that paying attention to sound in translation is an area that probably gets overlooked more often than, than not. We talked in our back and forth uh, of the text of going back, uh, doing a pass, an entire pass to the story, focusing on nothing but sound. And I'm going to give you an, actually an example of that. It's a very, very small example, but I think it, uh, it, it helps us uh, understand that a little better. And that's in uh, Nocturne. Back into Freddy Burger. <laughs> You have the book is on page 27. It's the it's the beginning. It's the it's the, it's the opening paragraph. It's that stage direction moment that he, that he's giving us, and you have sort of this 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 catalog of items that are in his, in his book. Uh, the delicate violet silk curtains, the brownish gray carpet on the walls, Japanese woodcuts, the small dark Louis the Sixteenth. On and on and on and on, and it builds up to a uh, phrase uh, that could be translated as invading fields, the uh, German, it could be translated as a little much. Well, so that you got this whole catalog of things, or items and so on, and so on, and it's final, that's all of it a little much. And that's we had at first as a translation. And ultimately uh, that became something else. I'll read you know, from about halfway down that paragraph. And a small crystal tray is an attractive jumble of gold cufflinks studded with small diamonds, tie tacks, rings with beautifully sparkling stones, bracelets made of platinum and gold. We're building up a catalog. Everything a bit flashy, and for a young man, which Freddie, after all, is oh, also tad over the top. Seems like a small difference, but in, you, you wouldn't be wrong with saying a, a, a little much. But it doesn't sing, and it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it can't really hold up after that long catalog of items. That so if you can go back and you pass through the, through the, uh, through the manuscript, and you focus on nothing but sound in the translation, this is the kind of uh, place where that, that, that can be crucial. It can make a crucial difference in how our how work uh, comes off. Yeah, I think so much meaning is in sound and rhythm. It's always the pleasure of reading is in how the words sort of are next to each other, not necessarily what they mean exactly. Right. But, well, I, yeah, I think, I think that, that's a good point. I, mean, I think it's often when you have a translator being lost in what's thought of as the meaning, or just on the meaning. But sound is meaning. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's, it's meaning, and it's also what we enjoy in a book, I think, on this. Uh, I know in a moment you're going to give us a longer reading, and this was not on our original list of questions, but oh. I, I just have to ask this cover photo 
Uh, I don't know if, if everybody can see it, uh, if there are copies you can look at. Um, it's a beautiful photo. Can you tell us a little about it? Well, yeah, but I also think it, uh, it underscores what we were saying about the various types, uh, that if you look carefully at each of these, uh, it's done by, I don't know that much about it, but it is done uh, with Versailles, who is well-known photographer. Uh, and uh, on our uh, note, it says that the, the photo credit reads a homosexual ball in Magic City, 1931. I think Magic City, somebody here may know more about that than I, but I, that was a, uh, uh, an event held in Paris uh, around Mardi Gras time, something like that. And um, so, it, and, and so it's, a, it's a real photograph done by a really, I think he's a Hungarian uh, photographer artist. No. But uh, we like the, we like the photo art. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's beautiful. I think it's so great to have a real photograph. When uh, we were working on When Brooklyn Was Queer and we were finishing it up, the publishers found this photo they really wanted to put on it. And they were like, it's a real period photo at Coney Island. And I was like, <laughs> yes, but it's a straight couple. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, but if you squint your eyes, it looks like two men. <laughs> and they thought they would blunt the woman's collarbone digitally and um, put in like extra eyebrows to make her look more like a man. And I had to say to them, like, you understand that what you're doing then is, is taking a straight couple, digitally manipulating it, and then putting it on my history book to make gay history. <laughs> So I'm glad you found a real photo. <laughs> <laughs> it was chosen by our publisher who uh, originally wanted to crop it mm. uh, that focused on the, uh, on the two characters actually to the left, mm -hmm. right? But um, that wasn't allowed under the copyright restrictions. And I think everyone that we ended up with something much more quickly. Yeah, I love because it, it gives you a sense of a big world, not just two people yeah, that could yeah, be, yeah. you know, standing yeah. in a closet somewhere taking that photo. <laughs> this is a party. Yeah, so. right. Exactly. <laughs> With all of that, will you, can I cede the stage to you and will you read a little bit to us from uh, the book? Sure. I have a couple of passages that yeah. uh, I could read. Um, uh, one is, the first is the opening, the opening passage of Nemesis, which is the first story. It, it, it has a lot of the characteristics that we talked about. It reflects Fanon's uh, uh, background in the theater. It starts with it uh, and has other other features that are characteristic of, of the entire work. Tear Garden, the Central Park in Berlin, near the Brandenburg Gate. It's July, and there's a full moon. With the air so warm and clammy, you could almost grab hold of it or splash into it as if it were warm water. It smells of asphalt, gasoline, and horses. On the pathways, shadowy figures, mostly male, scurry along from time to time. Trudy has reached the semicircle by the Brandenburg Gate and heads down a byway. Slender and of medium height with light brown hair and blue eyes, he's dressed in a sailor's uniform in which his shoulders and hips sway effortlessly, adopting a leisurely way of walking that at any moment could lead him to stand still without drawing any attention. It is the flaneur's well-practiced stride that shows, just as a merchant displays his wares in an easily surveyable and seductive manner, he's available, promises discussion, and guarantees satisfaction. For Trudy knows what he's doing. He keeps his head in the direction he's walking. Only his eyes glance discreetly back to the right. For there, maintaining a fairly exact distance, is Eric Gruner, violinist with the Philharmonic Orchestra. <laughs> Eric Gruner is already in his late 20s, but looks much younger, which in these circles should come as no surprise. He catches up to Trudy on the byway, walking almost next to him for a bit, then says decisively, good evening. Trudy softly and very shyly replies, good evening, a pause. Smiling, they silently look each other over. The continuation of the entire adventure hinges on this inspection. There's still time for an honorable retreat with some such words as, oh, sorry, I thought you were someone else. <laughs> but Eric Gruner finally says, what a 
fabulously beautiful evening. Trudy has trouble finding the proper response. He asks, do you perhaps have a match? That isn't supposed to mean that he wants something to smoke since he's already taking a cigarette out of the knot of the sailor's collar. It's just that it would be unthinkable for Trudy to begin an acquaintance in any other way than by the request for a light. It's part and parcel of his style and any departure from this formula can cause confusion or at least uncertainty. Eric Mooner lights a match and takes out a cigarette from his case thus beginning the solemn ceremony of the lighting of the cigarette, including the obligatory gazing into the eyes. They walk along side by side. By now, Trudy feels free to ask, why didn't you say something to me earlier? Eric says, laughing, well, I had to get a better look at you first. And with a furtive glance, he checks out Trudy one more time and says, who knows what might be running around, running around out here. Trudy, ignoring this last remark, says, where should we go? I don't know, says Eric, still a bit unsure. Do you want to go farther into the park? Trudy asks. At that moment, they stop in a secluded spot, both hesitating. They try getting to know each other in the darkness. They touch each other, find each other's hands, very discreetly, squeeze them, lean up against each other, breathe deeply, touch each other's foreheads, feel each other's breath, kiss. Then they hold each other tight as if they would never let go. After this wordless scene, Eric Bruner says, as if in response to it, we can take the streetcar to my place where it's comfortable. You live on the west side, replies Trudy. Yes, let's go, says Eric. And with that, they head up. Uh, the the uh, we talked earlier about the detail and the kind of detail that you find uh, in the work. It does and how real it seems, and that something like these, uh, these he has actually experienced. Um, and although it's not the first instance of a cruising in, uh, in literature, it's pretty early. And I think what's what makes it also different. I know you've cited like instances like a Whitman, where they were cruising in the skin, like late nineteenth century. Uh, what's different here is that he uses that to uh, as a basis of the whole poem, and that I've not seen before. Um, the other thing we've talked about is uh, let's see, page thirteen. Page thirteen. Let's see. And just a short paragraph that I think captures the uh, excitement and ecstasy and freedom that uh, was afforded people in this, in the clubs, uh, as they, uh, as they uh, more than one instance in which they're uh, led into the kind of, as, as Bernard puts it, Dionysian ecstasy. So meanwhile, the atmosphere in the hall has intensified. Poetry also lives in beer. It, isn't, it doesn't always have to be wine. A few glasses are enough to lend a certain aura to life. With a bit of alcohol in your veins, you can see the everyday through multicolored glass. In short, a Dionysian delight in heedlessness rules. People kiss in the corners and sit on one another's laps, some forgetful of the world their lives and everything else that exists, sit close together, silently holding hands, gazing into their partner's eyes. They get up like sleepwalkers, only when a new song begins. And then they dance some more, retaining their intimate embrace. Here, there are no lies. Here is simple humanity, all poor sinners, if you like, doing what they cannot help and being who they are. <laughs> Reading those, I uh, have to admit that I have a, a, a love for those that kind of like a I almost want to call it like purple prose of those 1920s stories, you know, those exclamation points, those those statements of life and what it is because they know <laughs> just gotten out of that world war and everything has changed. Um, no, it's, it's wonderful, it's wonderful, and thank you for sharing this with us. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, no, a couple more. So, um. Okay, two quick questions. What was the original title translated 
Germany's age. Uh, the original title is something like The Little Garden of uh, Erotic Comedy. Erotic so, Comedy? Yeah, the little, so he uses the word comedy in the title itself. Uh, I like um, your title. Has <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> uh, it translated into any other languages other than English? Pardon me? Has it been translated into any other language other than English? Uh, has it been translated into any other language? Well, I, see, I need to translate my book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to translate it. No. Uh, so, with, uh, you know, so you said he was straight, he got married, but then you're talking about some great intimate details that were biographical. I mean, this is not the kind of stuff uh, an outsider could write. Without actually being gay in there, I mean, you know, because it's, it makes you wonder was he, I don't know, he's gay. So, but I mean, these are very intimate details you're talking about. So, I mean, it seemed like you'd have to be one to write about that. Do you have thoughts about his sexual orientation? I mean, it's such detailed stuff about that. So, yeah. Uh, and it's not really clear from what we wrote. No, uh, it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't read too much into his having you know, gotten married uh, later in life and so on. I mean, we don't know what might have been, right. what decisions might have been behind this. You know, we don't know. Uh, so, but it doesn't necessarily indicate anything. So, once again, as with other, so many other things with him, we're were left with insufficient information, I'd say. The historian's lament. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. I'm just curious, it was published in 1920, and Weimar Republic just started the year before. So how much of, you know, Christopher Isherwood's uh, stories are about the Weimar epic, but it had just begun. So I'm curious about that. What what culture existed already? So you're saying like what this is the very beginning of the Weimar Republic, right. which we right. see sort of through the Isherwood lens. But obviously he's in a culture that seems already to exist. So right. was there a big gay culture pre Weimar yeah. Republic? Is that kind of what yeah. you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, uh, it didn't just pop up out of the so I would, you know, when one would, uh, I don't, I don't, you know, I'd hesitate to say too, too, too much just definitive about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know how, how much of a, you know, if you look in terms of you know, all the research, you know, and the sexologists and so on, as they called themselves at the time they had done, that, that goes back pretty, you know, so much of the 19th century and early 20th century. So, um, and there's been a long standing interest within the culture on a lot of these issues as well, so which suggests you know, a, a large gay population. Right. It's a good question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hirschfeld and all the other sexologists yeah. around him definitely yeah. had a universe that they existed in and grew up through. And, right. uh, and, and, they, and they were big targets. I mean, we all talk, we read about the, you know, the book burning, the most famous book burning uh, in, in Berlin. Which was largely Hirschfeld's library. Uh, that was in the front. And wasn't Hirschfeld himself, I think someone in the audience knows, um, beaten nearly to death just at the start of the 1920s? There was like a report that went out saying that he had died, even, I believe. So obviously, there was both a, a gay culture and a, a homophobic culture operating at the same time, even before we really get into the Weimar Republic. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious about the sort of expectation we have of this kind of fiction to give us something that we want. We want it to be sort of liberationist mm. or affirmative. And we also kind of, I think, wanted to struggle against all those restrictions back then, as if we don't have any today. Like, oh, this is amazing. And what's missing from this book, I think, in the best possible way, is never defensive. Mm. He, he is, they don't encounter outside limits to themselves, but they encounter all these other issues that we all encounter. They fall in love and they fall out of love and they argue and they break up and they cheat and they debate all of it. like so gay right. without being politically gay. Right. And I think that's really a strength. And 
Asia where the cell melanin column is all such a sparse shadow in the catastrophe is written much, much later. So it's a huge time difference. But I think we want fiction to do something for us, and he doesn't quite do it. I really like this book because what you said earlier, you, there's a lot of pleasure in this book. But pleasure is not a really great historical category. <laughs> what this, there should be suffering and protesting. <laughs> and instead, it was dating and hooking up. And it's really unapologetic. And that's a word that's supposed to be political, but it's not political. And I kind of like this about this book that it's, you can't quite put it in that box of mm -hmm. its protest literature. It's also not, it's not by any means the first book of gay stories in Germany. It's just a book. Right. And the fact that it had no audience ever and it had wow. kind of been sitting in silence for him, that's tragic in a different way. But that wasn't even the fate of this book. You thought, oh, it could have been sold and successful and people would have liked it. Well, that's what you said also about it, about being able to put the book in, in a box. It's the same with him, too. You can't put it in a box. You can't, just can't do it. And I think sometimes these kinds of encounters are like they're hard to find, but they're so great when you do because they are about the dailiness, you know, the prosaic mm -hmm. parts of life. The, you know, what did you do when your trick stole your overcoat? Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, important question. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> I know we're almost almost at eight o'clock. Uh, any the, a last question from anyone? Can I ask you? <laughs> yeah. Who declared which story was your favorite? I think because I really did not expect the way that they're really, that, that a relationship would spring from the two of them. I think that they, uh, you know, like maybe it's my own social conditioning and reading these kinds of stories, you know, and it just it didn't it felt so real, like the sort of thing that. How to put it in a, a movie that was very sort of political in the way of feeling, saying it would feel very heavy handed, you know, mm -hmm. for the two of them to meet in this way and then have something that actually sparks from it. But the way it's handled in this book, it was just so what it was. Uh, and that was so magical, like it magical without being feeling forced or unreal. The magic in it was just like that magic that happens to you on a regular basis, you know, where a weird thing happens and then it, it spirals from there, you know, and that just felt. It's that everyday quality, the surprisingness of it, uh, and its understatedness and its beauty. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just really was. I remember my two quick questions. So you said you had a time um, getting the book published because you had sales. How are sales, and how are sales of the German book, the version in Germany? Uh, well, we haven't gotten much information yet about and sales. Is it in Germany, is it like eight people reading it? It's interesting. Is it is it being read since it was being published in 2013? It's hard to find. It I would say helpful. publishing numbers, let yeah, alone yeah. in any country. I, I yeah, I don't know if we have any idea. I don't know if you have an idea of how the reprint is sold, but but the German book is no longer it's no longer the, the the publisher of the reprint is, is not the problem. It was oh. a small, very small publisher. Oh, uh, it's a. Uh, it, it, it wasn't much in terms of production values. Right. It seems not even to have been typeset. Oh, wow. Those margins are incredible. <laughs> <laughs> margins are about this big. <laughs> What's interesting to me is that whoever censored this book had to read it because there's, you, 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 have to, you have to read it to know what it's about. It's, not, it's illustrated, but the illustrations are modest. They don't really tell you anything. Uh, we looked at the uh, epigraph that he uses, and he sort of slightly avoids any sort of mention that might uh, draw attention to him. So somebody had to read it, <laughs> and they, they decided that this was worth banning. <laughs> you know all those those centrist busybodies who are like, no one else but me can read that passage. <laughs> I'll be taking every copy of that home, please. <laughs> well. Thank you for making this available to us oh, again. Okay. Uh, I think that this is quite an incredible document, and I think that people will enjoy the chance to dip into this little bit of a, a world that we don't expect and don't have many records of. So, thank you. Thank you, Bureau, as always, for being our fabulous host. Thanks to everyone who joined us online. You can also get the book on our online 